In addition to creating an amazing library of new titles on PlayStation 4, we're equally focused on delivering what gamers want most, without imposing restrictions or devaluing their PS4 purchases. For instance, PlayStation 4 won't impose any new restrictions on the use of PS4 games. That's a good thing. <laughs> we believe in the model that people embrace today with PlayStation 3 and continue to demand. Just heard you there. When a gamer buys a PS4 disc, they have the rights to use that copy of the game. They can trade in the game at retail, sell it to another person, lend it to a friend, or keep it forever. In addition, PlayStation 4 disc-based games don't need to be connected online to play. Or for any type of authentication. If you enjoy playing single-player games offline, PS4 won't require you to check in online periodically. And it won't stop working if you haven't authenticated within 24 hours. We remind ourselves that you gotta earn the consumer truck every day. Now, I know you might be quite enjoying what you've been listening to so far, but this next one's quite special because this is the first sketch that I was kind of properly involved with. First bit of acting, had to put on a Scottish accent and everything. It was a bit of a, bit of a stretch, really. Yeah, I was going to say, that's pretty hard for you, mate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, I'd beg to differ about this being your first skit, but yeah, maybe that other one's kind of lost to posterity because you were part of the FIFA skit when you came on as a guest yeah. first of all. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, no, but it's his first sketch where Yeah, the first proper one as proper an AI one. bot. Yeah, yeah. all right. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So yeah, Ali came on board with the show about the time where there'd been a story in the British news that um, food tests yeah. had found that horse meat was being sold as beef, as like minced beef in various products like lasagna, burgers, all sorts of things like that. So I had this weird idea that that could have happened in Farmville. Don't, oh, don't ask where that came from. <laughs> um, just one of those uh, weird ideas plucked from nowhere. Um, and we, uh, again, for people that are outside the UK, we have a program here called Newsnight. Uh, now it's on every day. It has been for like maybe 40 years or so. It's a, a long running show, a real sort of British institution. Uh, so we thought we'd kind of use the, the tropes of that. And um, they've got an interviewer called Jeremy Paxman, who's notoriously hard on all his guests. He's very aggressive, isn't he? Yeah. Um, so we tried to use, yeah, all of the, uh, the tropes of British BBC News and their sort of flagship programme, Newsnight. Uh, and to, to grind it into gaming as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to somehow like mash all that together. Like it's some kind of gaming horse meat burger that we'd created on our sketch. And again, like people listen to this, it's probably like, um, you know, people say there's two things you don't want to know how are made and that's sausages and laws. You could probably add AI bot skits into that as well. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to explain them anyway, just, just for you. Oh, there's nothing better than getting home from a long day at work and eating a Fender's lasagna. Right, wonder what's on TV. Keep in touch now with the BBC News Channel. Shocking evidence has come to light, seemingly showing that horses have been masquerading as cows in Farmville. The popular Facebook game has been rocked by these revelations, with many parents angry that their children have been conned into breeding horses instead of cows. It's a pure blatant scam, man. That's what it is. See, 
My wee Katie's been selling her brune coos in the game for 15 bloody gold coins when she should have been selling them as brune horses for 120. Single war family and no fellow with imaginary money. I'll see you in imaginary court. Besides the obvious financial concerns, some parents have voiced fears over possible health risks. Well, our Milo is allergic to horsehair. We never allowed him to buy horses in the game for fear of exacerbating the condition, but we assumed the cows were fine, as any parent would. No wonder he's been so wheezy these past months, poor little fellow. We invited the developer Zynga along for an interview, but they declined, instead giving us this brief statement. Zynga prides itself on the trust we have with our customers and the quality of products we offer. However, it appears that some of the development work for the cows in Farmville may have been outsourced to a third-party Romanian studio. We thank you for your interest in Zynga products. This is just a short demo of the full statement. To listen to it in its entirety, please enter your credit card details, blood type, mother's maiden name, and purchase 1,000 Zynga coins. An offer which we declined. We did, however, contact the Romanian developer in question. We were simply following the orders provided to us by Zynga. They requested us to create 3 million elaborate cow pattern coats in varying horse sizes, from 12 hands all the way up to 22. I distinctly remember the job. We'd coded the entirety of Aliens Colonial Marines on the Monday morning, then spent the rest of the week making the coats. Meanwhile, similar allegations are spreading to other developers in the industry. On last night's news night, legendary games designer Peter Molyneux was forced to defend himself against Jeremy Paxman and some damning historic accusations. So, to get this straight, Mr. Molyneux, you're telling me that in your game Black and White, the cow god creature was made up of exactly the same type of graphical geometry as the horse god creature. Well, yes, Jeremy, that's the way games work. Polygons are polygons. There's no difference between horse polygons and cow polygons. Yes, that's what some of the supermarkets said about their meat. So what you're really saying is that you, your company, sourced these generic polygons and simply added a cow texture to dupe the public. That's what this comes down to, isn't it, Mr. Molyneux? Th this is unfair. I mean, even the humans in the game, and the very world itself, were made up of the same basic graphical building blocks. Oh great, humans too now. So you're trying to turn our youth to cannibalism, are you? Jeremy, that's just ridiculous. Are you? You seem to lack a basic grasp of how video games work. Will you or will you not answer the question, Mr. Molyneux? Jeremy, with all due respect, these allegations are over ten years old and... And that makes it okay, does it? Jeremy, if you could be so kind as to let me finish... Let you finish what? Your 18-inch pizza Molyneux with a stuffed crust full of broken promises topped with pony pepperoni? Th this is all becoming very... And lie cheese! With all due respect, Jeremy, I may be guilty of many things, but I wouldn't put Chinese fruit on a pizza. Not lie cheese to fruit, you blithering ninny! Lie cheese! Cheese made of your lies! The game was made over a decade ago, and I no longer even work at Lionhead Studios. Yes, that's if it even was a lion's head. I bet you just took a horse's head, added some pipe cleaner whiskers and painted it yellow. Oh, for goodness sake, Jeremy. Anyway, just time for a quick look at tomorrow's headlines. The Times. Cameron pledges Shenmue 3 if given second term. The Express. Randy Pitchford on the run after killing Jim Sterling. No idea who they are. And The Sun. Freddy Star 8 by PlayStation 4. That's all from Newsnight. We'll be here the same time tomorrow. Join us. Good night. Hello, and thanks for calling Game Customer Services. All of our operator is busy. To order Mass Effect 3, no wait we haven't got that, I mean last story on Nintendo Wii. Oh hang on a minute, Dave's mouthing something. Oh, looks like you'll have to get that in Tesco too. Sorry. To order 2 million second hand copies of FIFA 2008, please press 1. Please. For little old me? Press it. Go on, you like football don't you? And it really would help us out. It's got all the players and everything. 
not as good as the one on N64 with Song 2 by Blur as the title music, but we stopped selling retro stuff years ago. Our mum made us take it all down Oxfam, even Goldeneye. And my limited edition Samurai Spirits Neo Geo Pocket. Not even the local orphanage would take Superman 64 off our hands though. I've eaten Superman 64 on toast for breakfast every single day since 2003, and I've still not dented the bloody pile. By the way, Maureen in accounts, says she'll give you a bit of slap and tickle in the broom cupboard if you buy those copies of FIFA. How's that for a reward card bonus? Hello. And thanks for calling game customer services. We've only gone and found ourselves a bloody buyer. Press 1 to join me in a celebratory dance of ultimate smugness. Press 2 to shout get in there, you mother lovers. Press 3 to light my Mahusiv Cuban cigar. Press 4 to gain access to our VIP party. It's all kicking off in here. Jay-Z and Chris Akabusi just arrived with Jed from Gladiators. Hang on, that's not Jay-Z, it's Dave Benson Phillips. Even bloody better. Mike from Human Resources is just pouring me my third pint of snake bite and black, I have a wicked Ribena moustache already. We are gonna party, like it's 1999. Or 1799 pre-owned. Get shark going out to the Dixie Fried Chicken Posse. Walking Store High Street, keeping it real. Now listen Bob. We got a new DJ here on Crackdown FM, but he don't come down to the studio. He phones it in, but he's gonna rip this session up. I have a listen. Listen carefully. I'm starting to load. About to explode. I'm butchering code. Like so much. Rogue kill. I've got more bars than Jeff Minter's sheep farm. And more hoes than farm bill, so. I'm the fire starter, main course, and dessert. I'm not on the ones and twos, I'm kicking it binary style on the zeros and ones. I look more dapper than Parappa, and he's crapper as a rapper, who's the daddy, I'm your papa, apple appointed, take me seriously. Get it, Siri, seriously, see what I did there? Oh never mind. When it comes to the true games master, I'm Patrick Moore, and you're Patrick Less. I'm Dominic Diamond, and you're Dominic Cubic Zirconia. We all talk bruv. Press hash, for gain customer services Moroccan division. Press 1, for one love in the place. Press 2, to tango. Press 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 1, here we go. Shout out to Gilius Thunderhead, Tyrus Flair, Axe Battler and the Golden Axe Gangster Squad. But where to the wise yo, kicking dwarves isn't big or clever, and they don't drop magic potions in real life. Holding it down. Like I'm on auto fire. All your baseline are belong to us. Much respect you to Cliffy B. The hardest working woman in the games industry. Swear down bruv, Cliffy B's a geezer. What do you mean Cliffy B's a man? It can't be. I've seen how much hairspray she puts on expenses. Shouts going out to shouts going out, to shouts going out, to shouts going out to shouts. Oh bugger, I'm stuck in a feedback loop. Can someone press F5 to refresh please? Or control or delete? Have you tried switching me off and on again? I can feel a blue screen of death coming on. Peace out brethren, it's been emotional. Error. 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 Error.
This is the one thing about stand-up, right? There are people, mixed audiences like there is tonight, right? And some people know some things and some people don't know other things. That's the bit that's always interesting about stand-up. You're kind of working around the fact that different people in the audiences have experienced different things and you're trying to find a joke that they'll all know. For example, right? I love saying what I'm going to say next because not just for the people who cheer in support of me, but also those who will silently judge me for this, right? Very simple. I love video games. I enjoy saying that, as I said, because half the room are looking to go, Ah, James, this is your 38. Nice. <laughs> Isn't that a bit stupid, right? You're not supposed to like video games. It's the largest entertainment industry in the world, and we're supposed to not enjoy it, right? This is one of the weirdest things to me at all. I am a gamer, and I'm very proud to be a gamer, right? Although I understand it's embarrassing. If I'm at a dinner party, and somebody goes, Hey, Dad, how do you relax after a gig? It's less embarrassing if I go, I masturbate to hardcore pornography. <laughs> Because once you've said that line, the rest of the conversation is exactly the same. Oh, I've not done that since I was a teenager. Oh, you should check it out. It's really moved on since then. I mean, the graphics alone are unrecognisable. I can't use all ten fingers. It's quite incredible. This reason over all of the art form, they do a thing which no other art form does, right? No other art form does. You cannot be bad at watching a movie. You cannot be bad at listening to an album. But you can be bad at playing a video game, and the video game will punish you and deny you access to the rest of the video game. No other art form does this. You've never read a book and three chapters in, the book is gone. What are the major themes of the book so far? Jesus, come on! You've never been listening to an album. After three songs, the album has gone. Dance for me. Show me how good your dance to get your dance. Is this good enough? And the album's gone. No, and stopped. play a character called Snake, yes, and when Snake dies, the camera pulls cinematically up from above him, and the voice of the man Snake has been speaking to on his comms unit goes, Snake, 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 every time he dies. When I play as Snake, he dies a lot. But the man's sadness seems undiminished by the regularity with which he has to mourn Snake. You think once or twice he'd go, ah, Snake. <laughs> you think it is some sort of debriefing session in this international espionage organization where they go, Jesus, Mick, you're very disappointed about the death of Snake, right? <laughs> and he's one of the best agents we've He was not Mick. We've looked back over the mission logs. His behavior in the field was erratic at best. <laughs> he spent most of the time just wandering around the battlefield for no reason. Just wandering around these talking battles.
it was coming up to E3 last year, and um, and Chazzy decided he needed to sort of take a bit of time out from the show. Yeah, going through a bit of a stressful period. Um, and to be honest with you, I was doing about 16 hours a week on the podcast, and I'd basically gone mental. It does, like, we were working really hard on something that it's, like, it starts out as a hobby, and then it ends up taking over sort of so much time, doesn't it? So, it becomes a second job, yeah. uh, let's be honest. I'm sure any, anyone else that's tried doing a podcast will completely understand that, and I think listeners have probably heard other people sort of mention it on shows. That, yeah, like you say, it becomes sort of this second life, and especially, like, also even just sort of promoting it online becomes kind of not, not a chore but not where you started off wanting to be do you know what I mean like starts off as this fun little hobby and then like you say it sort of becomes almost a business so, yeah um, so it was just coming up to E3 and then after E3 Ali and I were like shit we gotta get an episode out what, what do we do um, <laughs> so we just decided to just waffle and chat um, because we didn't really have any ideas because we were uh, quite stressed about the situation as well. Um, so we just thought we'd have a few drinks and I can't remember what time we stayed up till, but it was crazy o'clock in the morning. It was late, yeah, yeah it was really late. late. I think yeah. we did like, um, we got on Skype to record at maybe sort of eight or nine in the evening, but then we kept sort of putting off the record until we didn't start until like two in the morning and then finish at like five or something really silly. Then I was listening back to the show and there's this one bit where we'd mentioned Sue Pollard. Now it's quite convoluted and you'll kind of hear how it happened uh, when, when you listen to it in a minute. But I was just listening back to the show myself, uh, trying to do the edit. And I thought, there's probably something that can be done with that. So I Googled Sue Pollard interviews and thought, well, there's probably enough here to just sort of play around with and do something odd. And um, again, you probably hear that all of our minds were kind of in a weird space <laughs> at this time. This is like- <laughs> Very weird space. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like this is quite dark and odd and- um, As if Sue Pollard on a gaming podcast isn't odd enough. Odd enough, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is kind of, I think I was just trying to sort of make some light of the situation and, and like make Ali laugh like we were talking over Skype about about the edit and what to do and should we do a sketch and that kind of thing uh, so I just stayed up one late one night I, I never want to listen to a Super Hard interview again because like I had to download the audio for like I think I listened to about two hours worth of Super Hard audio just to sort of get the bits that I needed to chop it all down then I had this folder on my hard drive uh, with each file being like the words that it was and that kind of, oh man I got myself into a real nice like real bind <laughs> yeah. over it but it was quite good fun but I, I just wanted to sort of do something because like Chazzy says we're all sort of quite stressed and um and E3 is a stressing enough time for gamers anyway do you know what I mean like nice, Ali. so yeah I was just trying to sort of make Ali laugh with this and hopefully it made someone else laugh as well and uh didn't offend too many people <laughs> A lot of the choices around that era, um, they they got quite a lot of sort of like popular actors and actresses on board, didn't they? Like, um, was it um, Haley Joel Osman? Yeah, I'm sure he played Sora, yeah. like the main character. Um, I just learned last week that someone who's currently on like quite a big TV show done the voice of Yuffie, the Final Fantasy VII character in Kingdom Hearts. Ah. Don't know how I found this out, but I found it out just like yeah. recently. So it's just like popped into my head, like Yuffie, she's big, man. Whoever she was. <laughs> It doesn't actually matter at all. It kind of does. It's interesting because like, they did pick some odd people to do their voices for like the Advent Children era and that kind of thing. I bet it turns out to be someone you know, like not at all famous <laughs> and I can't even remember Turn why. Turn Sue Pollard. Like, yeah. Sue Pollard, right? I, like, I think I know who Sue Pollard is, but I need you to confirm this. <laughs> like, tell me, who's Sue Pollard? Who's Sue Pollard? Who's Sue In the Pollard? news lounge today, here to tell us about her 10 years of terrorising orphans, it's the rather lovely Sue Pollard! <laughs> I went to this fantastic place and it's, just, it's sort of like a s and shop. I thought, I've got to have a bit of that, you know. I've got a flat above the shop. When I go home, it's really good. The first thing I do, knock on the door, go in. I still get excited when I see lovely Hugh Fernley Whittingstall in an alcoholic haze, even in the afternoon. Sleazy looking. Because there was no mattressing or anything. Sat on a rocking chair with over 100 underage teen student girls for some slap, tickle and pop for the first time. It's fabulous. Just all the mashed potato. I used to love certain foods and then you'd go off them. The nice thing is that at least the carpet's not too soggy. Yet. They're usually tied somewhere. You might be there for say six or seven weeks. They learn about three months beforehand what they've got to do. And you can imagine what I'm going to say, can't you? There was a doorway, and if you went through the wrong door, you were stuffed, I'm afraid. And not only that, Don, you're not just doing it once a week. You're doing it eight times, and sometimes for months on end, on a regular basis, daily. There's also Neil Morrissey. 
I've not been to the gym for six months, darling, because, I mean, this is a great workout. I like to think I'm a role model for the older girl. And I'm more than happy to do this. I have a lot of enjoyment doing it. There's no reason why I should say no, to be honest. But I want to go to the toilet. So with a bit of luck, I think they should come out of this extremely well. And, and the sort of traumas that they come up with, all the sad things and the nice things, all ends up happily. People don't expect to see you have a McDonald's dress in ski pants. But you see, the greatest thing was he presented me with a banana shaped lunch box. I mean, it's a flipping big, big thing, you know. Yoda said to me yesterday, however bad things appear to be sometimes, Sue, he said, you know, the human spirit can rise above that. He, he said, choose wisely. So tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., I'm going to be. I couldn't. It's, it's nice that you can still pleasantly surprise people. So you guys at home won't know this, but while you were listening to that skit, uh, we were just talking to ourselves, and another yes. influence that we noticed on that was um, a guy that some of you will know, uh, Capone Adam. Uh, yes. He's, he's done a, he used to have a podcast of his own, and um, he's also worked quite closely with the Joypod team over time. That's right. Um, and I kind of felt that that Sue Pollard one was kind of my tribute to him in a way. And I think he was kind of an influence on the series skits and all sorts as well. Uh, so... Oh, yeah, he's been, he's been a massive influence on, on all of our skits, you know, totally. Yeah, with like the production and one stuff. of those other people who is trying to sort of make humour out of games. So um, we just thought we'd make another little tribute to him now in this little uh, Peter Molyneux thing. Our first speaker today doesn't really require much of an introduction. Um, he is, of course, Peter Molyneux. Right. Hello. My mic working? Yes, my mic working. So I'm a huge fan of what you've done. Ah, uh, thanks. I, I think what you've done is is, um, is 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 incredibly meaningful for this industry. Computer games have been around for a while now. They were the young kids in the block. Um, where every game that came out represented a new leap forward in technology. Well, that innovational curve has kind of slowed down now. And my whole point is, if we really want to introduce a new level of innovation into computer games, then it's things like emotion that are important. Like, how does it feel to be loved by something on a computer game? I felt what it feels like to be hated by things in the computer game countless times. I felt the emotion of wanting to kill things and destroy things. But what about caring for something? I think this emotion in gaming opens the lid of something which is very interesting. Is there any emotion we don't want to show? There's some very unsavory emotions in that tin. But at the moment, I kind of want to show them all. So if you have a look in that storage pit, you can just see here there is a barrel and on that barrel uh, is a little apple and in that apple you can just see there is a worm a dog uh, he, this is my dog, by the way. No other dog is going to look or behave like this. Um, now, let's talk about him. <clears throat> He's a fully morphing, uh, growing uh, dog. We put an awful lot of AI and empathy into a dog, which is highly, highly attentive and empathetic to what you're doing. That is, has got a mind that is partially formed by the very actions that you take in the game. The very actions that you take in the game. So, I've been in the industry since uh, 1989. In that time, I, you know, I've been involved with a lot of amazing people and had some crazy idea for some games. But I'm on a quest now. I'm on a quest to make a truly great game. Because really and truly, you know, I look at all the games I've done, if we just go through them, and I ask myself, are they truly great? You have to think different. 
You have to stand out from the crowd. Craziness is good sometimes. And now is the time to make a great game, you know. Why is now the time? Because gaming is truly everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in everybody's hands. There's a billion smartphones. A billion. A billion. A billion potential gamers out there. And at the moment, they're playing shit. I have to stand up and say all this experience, all these mistakes, all these stupid pigeons and shooting, um, shooting people with, uh, with miniguns. I've got to use all that experience and make something great. And make something great with the stuff that us designers have that we've never had before. We've never had the ability to reach out to, to millions, even billions. Billions? 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 And then there's one last thing which I'd like you to... It's a weird one. But for the first time ever, because of all this technology, you can start playing games and continue to play games. You're games don't die you know I remember the days where you used to have to save your game onto floppy and then the floppy disk used to get lost and oh, it was an absolute nightmare and that went on to saving it on your Xbox hard disk and then your Xbox went slightly wrong anyone had the red ring of death in the room yes exactly it's very frustrating well now we can keep these saved games like we keep photographs they're memories. They're memories of fantastic things that we have, of fantastic experiences that we've got. And lastly, not leastly, it is the golden age of input devices. You know, of, of, of touch. I mean, just think of that. As a designer, what's it mean? The word touch is an incredible word. To be able to touch and experience to touch a world, to manipulate a world. And don't think that these input devices are at the end. Don't think that Connect or Smart Glass or Move or, or any of those. Don't think that we're, we're at the end of that invention. Uh, well, we're not. We're just at the beginning. And so what all this does for me is it said one thing. I was working at Microsoft and I had a fantastic, amazing job. It was a you know, it's a lovely company, full of lovely people, doing lovely things. But it was just very comfortable. And I thought to myself, with all this technology out there and all these exciting things and this mass audience, you know what I have to do? I have to give up comfort. And I have to go out there and set up a new company, crazy although that is, and just experiment with one crazy, insane idea that may, just may, lead to a truly great game. game. A truly great game. game. A truly great game. And again now, we come to a sketch which was kind of based on a story that came up in the news at the time. Um, I suppose you'll hear it for yourself in, in the skit in a minute. But also, there's a strong um, Wallander theme throughout this entire sketch. And at the time, I was actually the only bot who had, who had seen Wallander. Even then, it was just the British version, so there was this, um, again, kind of meta thing where we're parodying the, the Swedish version of the show without having seen it. Is that a good yeah, thing? Is well, that allowed? I mean, Well, I had on. this idea that like, it needed to be done because like, Wallander was kind of the big talk of British TV at that time, do you know what I mean? Like, it was like hitting all the ratings and stuff. And it was like, well, that fits perfectly because it, like, it's a Swedish story and it just all seems to fit, except, again, I, yeah, I hadn't seen it. So <laughs> I had to sort of go off and watch all these YouTube clips, try and sort of like immerse myself in it for like a couple of days. But um, I couldn't get my head around it, really. It just seems sort of so low key. Do you know what I mean? Like, so we just tried to sort of try to carry the theme of 
what I saw as the theme of the show throughout it. And then just get incredibly like sort of xenophobic and slightly racist by just making out that everyone in Sweden talks like the Swedish chef. I'd argue that it's quite the opposite of that. The message <laughs> is clear that like we're attacking it from the other angle. I well, I hope so anyway. Yeah, fingers <laughs> crossed. There's me well, thinking. There's me thinking in my head that that's how it comes across. Oh no, I'm being totally anti-racist here. Tap tap tap. Um, and then oh man, yeah. So if anyone read it that way, then uh, it's not. Well, we do, uh, admittedly, we do try to address that at the end with the whole Jim Henson stuff. And then well. yeah, but but then kind of make it worse at the same time. <laughs> that's us. Yeah, making it worse since, <laughs> since two years ago. Yes. Just play the skit. They'll make up their own minds. It's all yeah. good. Tramway across northern skies Cause my blue Wallander speaking. Who's this that is the one that is calling me? It's Sergeant Wolfenbergson. There's reports of gunfire from a house in the village and what sounds like a dozen American ten-year-olds insulting a mother. Can you meet me by a tranquil lake in one scene's time? The same one we always film at? By gum, you're good, Wallander. Or is it Sherlock said nowadays? <laughs> ah, Sergeant Wolfenbergson, we meet again. Wallander, glad you could join us. This is Inspector Olufsen. Good to meet you, Inspector. Hursty thirsty to you too, Wallander. I've heard a girl a lot about you. Chazzy man, you can't do that. We're trying to weave a cutting edge tapestry of parody here. Yeah, man, you told me the AI bots was going highbrow and arty, like Dear Esther or Lady Gaga or something. That's why I agreed to be co-host. It's an elaborate juxtaposition of that news story about the Swedish police raid on the Call of Duty kids and the sophisticated, considered tone of the police drama Wallander. Oh, for goodness sake, guys. It's what everyone thinks when they think Swedish. Like, you know, the chef and the Muppets. Are you telling me the Muppets are racist? No, no we're, not we're not saying, saying that. that. It's just... Well then, can we uh, carry on? <clears throat> The smush the burst the house, where the gun fire was heard the good is the worst dude. <laughs> it's just the times have changed. Yeah, people have different sensibilities nowadays. Oh, and they have different accents and that now, do they? What do you mean? That's just a stereotype. Well, while you two are watching the BBC localised version, with all the posh voices and that, I've been getting into the original. Eh? Hey? What? Look, pass me the laptop. Here we go. The proper Swedish version. Watch this. <laughs> Well, in Dursta Bursta speaking, Hirsch the Gursta Gurdy Bird. Sure, Bibber, but Wolfenberg and Shun. Hirsch the Bursta Gurdy Hurd the Burst. The Hirsch the Burg we always film at. Sure, Bibber, Bursta Hirsch the Herfitter. <laughs> See, it does sound like the Swedish chef off the Muppets. So you're saying Jim Henson wasn't being a racist? No, I'm not saying that. You might want to see this. YouTube, controversial Henson footage. I am the count, and I love to count. Who won? Who won racial stereotype? Ah, 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 ah. Two, two racial stereotypes. Ah, 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 ah. We take you now to Kermit the Frog with another fast-breaking news story. So I said, you stinking Belgians can shove your overpriced Belgian chocolate between your Belgian buns. Uh, Kermit, we're rolling. <coughs> Hi-ho, Kermit the Frog here for Sesame Street News. Hi, Bert. Hi, Ernie. Um, my rubber ducky told me the PBS has liberal ideals that don't fit with my neocon Zionist agenda. So I'm heading over to Fox News. <laughs> oh, Ernie. So, there'd been a lot of news and stuff uh, around this time about basically lots of studios outsourcing all their work. Um, I know it was, I think we came to it from the point of view of uh, Gearbox had outsourced Aliens Colonial Marines, I believe. And we thought, wouldn't it be fun if uh, we actually tried to outsource our skits and take maybe some of the stress out of doing them? So, Dan uh, sort of went away and then fired up the pun machine. Yeah, and I did fire up the pun machine and also it's quite odd this one because again it kind of relates to where we, we were all sort of burning out and, and getting stressed and uh, I was finding doing the skits sort of more and more of again I 
I've kind of felt to myself that if there wasn't a joke there, to force it was um, uh, almost criminal. Yeah. Um, so this one's kind of a meta joke about forcing jokes as well. Like it's got its own sort of meta strand about me not wanting to do the skits and outsourcing it and yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so it's all kind of quite closely tied with the uh, the reasons for the show ending really I suppose yeah. um, so we just want to sort of give a bit of the sort of humanity behind it as well yeah I just thought right I'm going to write the worst jokes ever uh, if there has to be a skit it's going to be <laughs> the worst jokes ever ironically that's it, it actually burn it down out, yeah uh, well that's yeah um, but ironically it turned out quite good and people seem to like it so um <laughs> And also, in doing one that was about outsourcing, it's one of the ones that I actually had to do like the most amount of editing work on, like editing all of those jokes down from the takes of doing them, because um, we all had to try and sort of get the intonation right or wrong, yeah. as the case may be. There was um, a lot of different tries on lots of different accents and intonations, and yeah, it became a bit of a monster in itself, that skit. We were trying to hit just a general European accent and then kind of just hit some very, very bad stereotypes. In the intro to it as well, it's got, um, I think, my favourite line from Ali of all time. It's the, uh, I quite like German jokes actually, just sort of delivered so deadpan. In fact, there's, there's a couple of lines in that little bit where we're talking about, oh, you'll hear it, it'll, it'll make sense. But uh, Ali's deadpan in the intro, like had me in stitches That's when brilliant. I was editing it together. So Absolutely brilliant. Um, so if you want to listen to bad jokes, here you go. Damn. Mate, we haven't had any skits for the past two shows. <laughs> what do you mean? I've been totally skits for the past two shows. No, you know, skits, sketches, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, it's funny you should mention that. We just had a message come through on the AI bot's answer phone. You have one new message. To listen to your messages, press one. Hello there, this is a message for the AI bots. My name is Wolfgang Namstyle. I'm the CEO of OMFG. Outsourced media for games. We've noticed that your show has had no comedy skits for two episodes, and I'm calling to offer a solution. Mate, it's the not that European podcast outsourcing scam again, is it? I've already told plan. you about that. Our patented German joke writing supercomputer uses precisely calibrated algorithms and a vast database of video game trivia to craft the finest geek humour possible. And I'm not it's being funny, but German jokes? They're not exactly known for their sense of humour. I quite like German jokes, actually. Well, even if the jokes are alright, people are going to know that it wasn't us. He's got a point, Dan. They'll never sound like us. And there's grumble weeds. We use the finest voice actors available in Europe so that even your most dedicated listeners will be unable to tell that it is not the three of you talking. If you'd be interested in an obligation-free test skit... They'll seldom do us a free trial. Hamburg, what have we got five, to lose? <laughs> Alright, as long as it's free. But don't say I never told you so. Thank you very much, please. Goodbye. Knock, knock. Who is there? Bioshock. Bioshock who? Buy your chocolate cake and get a cookie for free. <laughs> I'd say, i say, i say. My Geodude has no nose. How does he smell? Being a rock-type Pokemon, he has no olfactory senses, and stone has no aroma to speak of, so I'm not entirely sure what you mean in either sense of the word smell. Why are Metal Gear Solid fanboys like reluctant jockeys? I am not knowing. Why is this? Because they dislike riding. <laughs> Why was Six scared of Seven? Because Final Fantasy Seven heralded the end of the cartridge era, of which Final Fantasy Six was a prime example. Knock knock. Who is there? Doctor. Doctor who? No, Doctor Mario. <laughs> Why, allegedly, is the new Xbox allegedly like a broken watch, allegedly? We, we do, do not, not know. know! Because, allegedly, the second hand won't work! <laughs> the blacksmith has escaped our dungeon full of JRPG stereotype characters. How do you know it was the blacksmith? He made a bolt for the door. How does the Sega tell you to eat your greens? I am not sure. How does Sega tell you to eat your greens? Choo Choo Rocket! How does one prevent Sonic from getting a suntan? You must tell me, how can one keep Sonic from getting the suntan? Shadow the Hedgehog! 
What's black and white and red all over? What is black and white and red all over? The European box art for Resident Evil 4 on both the GameCube and PlayStation 2. Other regions and formats vary. How does a two-dimensional dog from a rhythm action game stop his sweets getting furry in his pocket? I do not be knowing this. Perhaps with a rapper. How does Batman's mum tell him his dinner is ready? I do not know this. Dinner, 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 Batman. Actually, this, this is a false question. As, as any fan will tell you, his parents died when he was a child. But I would imagine, hypothetically speaking, she would contact him via uh, uh, the in-ear communicator from Arkham Asylum, or maybe even just a simple text message. <laughs> How do Obama and Joe Biden settle their differences in World of Warcraft? How do they do this? PvP. Why did Dom from Gears of War's wife get cold at night? Why did the Dom's wife from the Gears of War get cold? He always took cover. Why do people still enjoy playing the unicycle racing game Uni Rally on the Super Nintendo? Why does people still play the Unirally? Because it's not too tired. <laughs> what is Liu Kang's favorite drink? What is his favorite? Martel Cognac. Why did the local area networking engineer quit Gearbox Software? Tell me. He was bored, Olans. <laughs> Why does blood drip down Dracula's walls? I am unsure. Why does blood drip down Dracula's walls? Because the castle's vainier. Why don't Waterfowl go to the Sony Christmas party? Why is this? Because Crash banned a coot. Why doesn't Jason Rubin drink Strongbow? I do not know. Why does he not drink this? He prefers Dark Siders. <laughs> How did Agent 47 get from the clifftop to the sea below. How did Agent 47 get from the clifftop to the sea below? Hitman Abseil Ocean. Which action platform game star owns the most French cars? Please, do tell me. The Prince of Persia. <laughs> what sandbox game did Jesus' disciples play in his boat on the Sea of Galilee? I do not know. What game is this? Saints Row. Why is the first portal like Ricky Butcher of EastEnders? I need to know, why is the first portal like Ricky Butcher of EastEnders? They both only originally came in the orange box. Why did the frog cross the road? I do not know why a frog did cross road. Because Konami needed a simple and recognizable sprite in a color that would stand out from both the black road and the blue water sections. Why does Kazhirai sometimes have uneven stubble? Tell me, why is uneven stubbliness? A ridged razor. <laughs>See, I told you they'd be rubbish. Actually, I thought those jokes were just as good as our usual standards. Fuck off! Oh, they might be alright for Kirby's Christmas Cracker, but can we not just do the skits ourselves next time? Yeah, yeah, suppose yeah, so. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah.
anyway, so um, yeah, we hope you enjoyed a sort of like little insight into a like listening back to the skits and maybe a bit about ourselves and kind of where we were at the time and, when we were making them and our bonkers brains. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and um, <laughs> like yeah, because I think we're all a bit bonkers in a way, aren't we? And um, that probably all contributed to like, things all going a bit weird. Um, so uh, we don't really know what's going to happen with the future of uh, the show as it was. It, it's not going to be the same as it was, no matter no. what happens. Uh, like that's kind of season one of the AI bots done. We're all looking forward to sort of working together in the future, like exactly. however that pans out. Um, and one thing I will say is that um, every time we got a letter from a listener or a review on iTunes or something like that, it really made our day. And yeah, totally. I'm guessing if anyone that makes a podcast knows that. Um, now the, the reviews are handy for like getting uh, getting noticed more on iTunes, but um, the letters and the emails that you get from people, where they actually sort of explain a bit about why they've listened to the show. Yeah, just um, the feedback in general. Yeah, you know, like any feedback. Um, it's just sort of so heartwarming to, to hear. Yeah. That, um, we just want to say that if you've got a favourite podcast that you listen to, no matter what it is, like, uh, send them a letter. Um, yeah, let send them, them an email, let them know. Just give them some feedback and just let them know that there's someone out there that's listening and, um, you know, really enjoying what they're doing. Because, you know, they're doing this for free, so... And it's a two-way stream, do you know what I mean? Like, um, when I've listened, from when I started listening to podcasts, I've, I have written in and emailed and that kind of thing. And it's sort of half the fun of it, that the listeners are almost just as much a part of the show as the people making it. Yeah, you'd be amazed how much sort of sitting up at like four in the morning trying to edit something and then someone fires you off an email, how much that can really energise you to really put that extra bit of effort in and make the show even better for that person, you know? So do it, you never know, it might actually make your shows better. And we're going to be uh, kind of in that vein. Uh, we're going to be starting to stream yes. on Twitch TV. Uh, you can go to twitchtv.com forward slash the AI box and like kind of interact with us live there and then. Yeah, so, basically, if you want to come, if you've ever wanted to talk to us, um, then yeah, just come along and have a chat with us in the chat or get on the Skype and have a chat with us while we're actually playing games. Yeah, and if you don't want to talk to us, you can be one of them Twitch lurkers. Yeah, it's all those, fine. <laughs> those really weird people that don't yeah. say anything. That, that, that's the kind of, I tell you what they remind me of, those people like when you're in the arcades, like when you were a kid in the, in like the mid-90s, and you'd be just playing on something like, you know, uh, Dragon Ninja, and then someone would just look over your shoulder and you'd sort of get this weird presence just behind you, and you'd sort of look over and go, you right, mate? And they just sort of nod and then keep watching the screen and you just think, Weird, aren't you? Although that's quite a good analogy for another part of Twitch. You know, when people are trying trying to tell people what to do too much, they try yeah. to tell the streamer exactly what to do. Like, I'm trying to work out the puzzle for myself. I'm playing a puzzle game. Like, <laughs> like I'm playing Zelda. Don't tell me exactly what block to put where and how. Like, no, that's exactly. like the kid at the arcade who's like, yeah, do you know how to do a dragon punch? Do you know how to yeah. do a dragon punch? Let me do it for you. I'll do it. It's like, no! Leave I... me alone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Although, uh, I suppose that was in the arcades. I've never figured this out. Were they doing that just to get a go of your game? Even if you took the stick back afterwards? Like, did they really care that much yeah. about that three seconds of doing a Dragon Punch? They just wanted a free 50p go on an arcade machine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those sneaky... And also, you can still find us uh, on Twitter, uh, at the AI bots. And, and obviously, uh, on iTunes. Oh, yeah. Um, the archive's back up there. So if you want to listen to the old shows where the skits were from, um, go back and give those a listen. So yeah, thanks for listening, um, and thanks for listening over the time we were actually doing the show as it was, and um, yeah. Cheers, you guys. might hear from us soon. Uh, oh, also, it's the actual birthday coming up in a couple of weeks, so watch out, there might be a special birthday episode, anniversary thing, depending on if we can get together. Fingers crossed. Right, shall we uh, let, leave these people alone now? Let's do that. Alright, see you all later. Laters. Bye-bye, Bye. 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 Bye.